Okay. Well, hello everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Um, today is my turn, and I will be presenting Chapter Five, um, Control Flow. Uh, feel free to ask any questions at any time. Let me open the chat, uh, or just mute yourself, or raise your hand, or wave at me. Do whatever you want. Um, let me know if I go too fast or too slow. And don't be scared if you hear uh, like sirens because I live in front of a busy street. So, and you might hear some people shouting as well. So don't be scared. Okay. So um, I imagine lots of you are, or most of you are familiar with control flow. And so I hope this is not too boring. Uh, this is an overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, we have choices and we have loops uh, choices. The way I like to see it is that you can think of uh, you making choices every day in your life. Like what are you gonna eat? What are you gonna wear one day? Um, and so when we talk about choices, we have, um, we can think of two keywords, if and else and the first one, it will be you just have an if. So you do if, and then you have a condition. And then if that's true, then you do something. You take some action or, or call a function, anything. And then uh, you can have the sequence as if something is true, then do that. If not, or else, do something else. What they call here, a false action. Um, here, for example, if you want to evaluate n different conditions, so then uh, ideally, the they, what I call the efficient way, it will be that you have like a chain of if else, and if else if. So you do evaluate for condition one, if that's true, then you uh, do whatever is in, for this condition, whether is that action. And then you don't have to evaluate all this code. And I call it efficient because then you avoid having to evaluate all this code unnecessarily. Uh, and then here, the right hand side, we have a the same thing, test for end conditions. But please don't do that because <laughs> it can be very inefficient. So I imagine you have uh, like 1,000 different conditions to test for. But you know that only one of them is true every time. So you're wasting a uh, few milliseconds every single time, maybe more. It depends how complex your condition is. Okay. Uh, on the textbook, there was a great example. So it was a simple function, which you just give it an X value. And then based on the value of X, it will give you return A, B, C, or F. And so you just call the function, for example, here 99, it returns A, uh, 50, and it will return F. Um, there's invalid inputs for any. So uh, you can't have a strings like this. You can't have uh, logical or empty logicals, excuse me. Uh, you can't have NAs. I think with NA, with this three, you will, give you some error message. Um, there's an like, hmm? For questions. Oh. Um, there's an ex exception for that. And is that you have a logical vector of length greater than one. But in that case, it will just take the value in the first position. It will ignore everything else. Um, and then we have the vectorize if or the if else. And so this one was for a single true or false, a single logical value. And this one will take um, any size, one to n um, vectors. So here in this example, x is a vector of one through five, the sequence. And then here, just evaluate if uh, the module, modulo of two for that x, if it 
just to find out if a number is even or if it's odd. Let's see, uh, I know lots of you like uh, the tidyverse stuff. And so with dplyr, you can do the case when. And to be honest, I'm not very familiar like using case when. Uh, I found the notation a bit funny that you have to use this curly dash. I don't know what you call it. I call it pigtail. Um, for here, this will be the analogous of this if else condition. I guess uh, for larger vectors, you get better performance or when you use the pipe operator, then this will be, this will make more sense instead of using if else. See, um, then we have uh, the fancy if chain or the switch statement. Uh, so a switch statement, um, imagine you have like that grades function. So you have if, else, if, else, if, else, something. So you could have something like this code or which, I mean, for this case with where you have only uh, three, four different uh, options, it's okay. It's still readable. But then if you compare it to this one at the right hand side using a switch, to me, it is more readable. Like it's easier to read and uh, go through this code than going through all this one. A cool thing uh, that I would like to, and that they say on the book is that if two categories, so for example here that you have this Lex function, the two categories uh, have the same value. You want to have the same value. You can ignore the right hand side. So for example, if you call here legs uh, with cat, that will return a four. And there's nothing here to the right hand side, but then that will fall back to the, the next category. So you could save time if you're too lazy to type uh, like each, each entry. So. I don't know, you have a list of animals with four legs and you want to type equals four every single time. So you just leave it blank and then it will fall, fall back to this one. See, uh, I think we could come back to this at the end. Uh, these are the exercises from the textbook. Um, so now we have loops, the next category. Um, and so you probably have like found yourself in a situation that you have to repeat some sort of code uh, for multiple lists, a list of lists or I don't know, a data frame that you have to go row by row. But for some reason you don't want to use uh, the apply functions with, or something else. So let's say you need a four. And there are three different flavors to do uh, fours or loops. Uh, there's the for loop, uh, which it takes a list of uh, indices or a list of elements, and then it will loop through each of them. And so the way it works is you have an item variable, which usually is i, j, or k, and I have used l, m. So it's usually a single character and it's starting with i. I guess they that ijk comes from physics maybe when you use vectors in physics maybe I'm not sure um and then you perform some action which you'll do however many elements this vector has then you have a while uh and then this will execute until this condition is true uh i think i didn't include it here but something i used to do a lot during my first year of computer science was to do while true. And so we just, it's like an infinite while. So it will keep doing things until you break uh, inside. And I will show you, I will, I will, I have it in the next slide uh, what the, the breaks and continues are. Uh, so it will perform an action until this condition is false. And then the repeat, that's the equivalent to the while true. So it will repeat until you explicitly say break. I want to break this loop. Uh, here's the notation uh, for the for loops. Um, there is the, the there's two ways to terminate a loop. 
early. So you can terminate the loop after you iterate on each of those elements. So three times here, or you can skip um, for a particular index. So for example, here, if uh, the, I, the value of i is a module of two, then it will go to the next iteration. So for i equal to, it won't print i. And then I have the output there for this small chunk of code. So it will print one, three, five, seven, nine. It will skip the numbers that are module two. Um, and then there is the break. So for example, I'm telling this code that if i is module five, like if that module is zero, or it's a multiple of five, then I want to break. So I want to terminate that, that loop. And so the result of this will be one through four. Um, there are some common pitfalls that they call. So I think, and I was doing this actually, I just changed some code today because I was like, hmm, that's actually makes sense. Uh, if it is good, a good practice to pre-allocate uh, your output containers. So let's say you have uh, inside of a for loop, you're filling a list. So it's a good idea to pre-allocate or reserve that space. Say, okay, create a vector of list of this length. Um, and I guess you will see the difference when you have like very long, uh, 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 like a long list of elements. Like if this means instead of, instead of having three values, it had 100, then it will make a difference, a significant, uh, a significant difference. Then another thing that I used to do as well <laughs> is uh, when trying to do uh, the indices for a for loop, I will do one column length of whatever I want to loop through or n row or n call. And apparently that's not a good practice because you can get in the point that whatever your length, whatever your rows, the n row or n call is zero. So you get with the list of indices one zero, which is something you don't really want. Because then when it goes to this zero indice index, A it will give you an error. And so they recommend to use seek along. And there's another one that I use seek length. Um, so, cause this ones will return a, like it's the same, a sequence of length of whatever number of elements has this X. So two things that I was doing wrong before reading this chapter. Um, they have, these related tools, which I think I already talked about then, the while and repeat, uh, they said that you should always use the least flexible approach. So what this means is a for loop is le uh, less flexible than a while loop and less flexible than a repeat. And so ideally you can, if you have a for loop, you can transform that into a while loop. If you have a while loop, you can transform that into a repeat. But they say you can't go in the other direction, like a repeat to a while or a while to a for loop. I should try to do that. I don't know if any of you have done it. Um, here is just that for loop I show you at the beginning, uh, using a while and using a repeat. So for the while, uh, I start the index, index i in zero, initialize i in zero, and I say while i is less than 10, then I increment i in one, and then I do my evaluation. Um, if it's even, then the next, if not, then print. And then similar with the repeat, I just tell it if is greater than 10, then break. So break, break that loop. Uh, if it's an even number, then just go to the next one. And I think this might be wrong now that I think of, because it should be equal, greater or equal, because I think this will go with I11, 
if I was to print all the i's up here, at some point I will have i equals 11. So be careful. Uh, this, these are the exercises in the textbook. We can come back to those if we have time and if you want to. Uh, and then the conclusion, <laughs> this was a very short, short chapter. Um, I found in one of the previous cohorts presentations that they had uh, this diagram and they say, can we put these concepts together in a diagram form? Um, so you have F, uh, FL, so the vectorized F, the for, the while, and the repeat. And then if you go to the diagram, then for the if you have a condition that can be true. If it's true, then you do something, take, do some actions or execute a block of code. If not, then I guess down here you should say quit, like, or you finish that, um, that block of code. Then with the if else, uh, then you have a condition. Uh, and I didn't put in my, my slides for when this happens, your condition, it will be, it will return a vector of like ev with the evaluation of each entry. So if you have three, a vector of length three, uh, when you do the condition, you have a logical vector of length three. So for each entry, you have if it's true or if it's false. And so based on that, you will perform an action. Uh, for loop, you uh, have some set of numbers, some vector, then you initialize your counter variable or whatever you call it. And then you repeat for each value of i inside that set, repeat some task or tasks and then quit. Um, similarly with the while, you just repeat something until this condition is false. If it's true, then you keep doing it. And for the repeat, then you need to explicitly put that break somewhere in your code with the break. If you don't put that break, uh, it will just keep doing things forever. No, I don't I mean, not, li li not really forever. At some point it will break, I guess. Uh, and then I had the quiz um, that we can look the quiz together. So what's the difference between if and if else? I think I've been repeating this, like one takes a single logical value, or zero one, it's a vectorized version of it. Um, in the following code, what will, what will the value of y be if x is true, what if x is false, and what if x is na? So if x is true, you get number three. If x is false, then you get it null, because that's the default value of the if. If it's false, then it will return null. And if it is na, you get an error. I don't have it here, because sharing them will let me render or knit the, the slides with an error. Uh, this switch, go ahead. Uh, I have a question about the if else and when, uh, like if anybody knows how to do an if else and return like a vector or a list, because I've, I know that the if else, the vectorized one that's built into R, if you try to return anything but a scalar, like just a single atomic value, um, it'll only return the first index of whatever you try to return. And so I don't know if like dplyr if else or case win, if that allows you to return something complex like a list of two to three elements, does anybody know that? I think the idea of if else is that it returns a vector of the same type, um, which is why like if you have if you say like in one of your if else conditions, like um, you return like a character and a number, then the output will just coerce it all to character. Um, and so I think by design, it's not supposed to return complex lists. Um, it can only handle vectors as output. Yeah, so do you know if there is a way to return like a complex list? Say you're like 
you're you're mutating a column in a a, a data frame and based on the value in that column, you're subsetting a like, like list of um, characters or whatnot. And so you want like a list with like any number of characters in it as your mutated column. Um, do you know a way to do that? Does case win allow you to do that? Or I, I don't think if, underscore else does, but maybe case one does. I think you'd want to use like a map and then have an if else. Of Inside like, of it. Not the vectorized if else, but the yeah. logic if else as your function that you pass to map. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's the way I've been doing it, but I thought there might have been a better way. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks. And then finally, we have to switch. And I think we already covered this that when you don't have a right hand side value, it will fall through and fall back to the next one. So, this um, you pass the x as a string, then it will return a number two. So, then there's nothing here, but then the next category it has a two. And I think that's what I have. There are questions. I guess I was wondering a little bit about maybe it's the way R is written, but why Hadley suggests using the least flexible option. Is that just because it's faster? Like, mm. that's because it's question. safer. It's safer. <laughs> yeah, because what happens quite often is when you have like a large amount of data and you're looping through it, is you'll have something that goes wrong, like you have like um, infinite value or an NA value or something which calls a null or something like that. And if you keep going through the process, you might miss out on that. Or alternatively, there'll be some kind of error that occurs and it will just continue repeating through the system. And you might not ever be aware of it unless you have a less flexible system. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I feel like also knowing Hadley's like philosophy, it might just be like a readability issue, like at heart. Just like if you can be more specific um, with what you're doing, then just do that for future people reading your code. Yeah. I mean, I know I, I guess, was, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna say that when you're developing code, like you usually don't think of someone using your code. You think of, if I understand what, how it works, then it's fine. I don't put comments, anything, but then, you come back in like some time afterwards and then you are like, what What was this supposed to do? Like, and then you have to work again your way to understand your code. At least I, that happens to me a lot. I don't know, you. maybe you remember. <laughs> so readability for me, now it's very important. Like I want to understand now and then in the future, but for my future self as well. So. And research and code has shown that these highly idiomatic code it is um, causes problems 10 years down the line because it was something that was easy to understand for a particular group at a particular time but 10 years later and this code you know so those will be completely in, uh, impossible to understand secondary effects will be crazy so that's why I guess why he goes for the let's do the strict one not the one that becomes yeah. Monkey patching. He talks about also uh, like R, the language itself. Like, I mean, it's an old language. So things that, I don't know, a few years ago were just fine. Now they are weird, like, or they are unnecessary, or they make things more complicated. And I guess that's 
the cool thing that now you can have like a package that solves that or kind of patches that. So I like that. Like it's, you can, it keeps evolving in some way. Like it's still like, you still have to stick to the base code, code. But with a package, you can kind of patch little things here and there. Yeah, I think this, I know early on when I was writing code, like um, uh, Camilla was saying, when you run into an exception and you've got a really flexible like while statement in there and you don't have any like messages or anything to track progress of something completing. And like my code was so inefficient that waiting a couple minutes for it to complete, especially for like web scraping was normal. And so if something ran long, I would let it run for 10, 15 minutes before stopping it. Um, just because I would, you know, most of the code was taking a while, but if you've got a while loop in there, it's oftentimes like your while loop is just looping over and over again. Cause you forgot an edge case. Um, and it's just remaining true and there's nothing updating on screen. So you're just sitting there waiting for 20, 30 minutes sometimes. And then you realize it's like, oh, I forgot this one case and the like condition statement there, it was just looping over and over. Um, and I think that's why they go for, you know, as inflexible as possible, especially if somebody else is gonna use your code. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I rarely use a while or a repeat. <laughs> I, I can't think, to be honest, of a, a why will I use a while? I think I, I think only use while like in like optimization problems. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you use map or per all those? Do I use map? Yeah. I, yeah. That's you mostly what I use. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, okay, real quick. Um, I like have a use case of while, which is like if you're doing like sampling, um, like, and you don't know beforehand like how many samples you're gonna need for a, an amount of accepted samples. Like if you're sampling from using like rejection sampling, for example, um, then in that case you have to put a while because um, you you can't like track progress of, along something. Um, so like while we have less than the target number of accepted samples, um, try out the sampling. Um, and so like it comes a lot, comes up, comes up quite often in statistical computing at least. Yeah. yeah also, if you don't know when something's going to happen in a data set, like the thing I'm thinking about that is the only thing I've used while for in a long time recently was a background process that like measured a uh, like a price. It was like a trailing stop and it measured a price at one second intervals until it hits a certain spot and then it you know does an action at that spot. So that's when a while loop is really useful when you don't know the end point of something. Yeah, I guess for in, in a case like that, well, when you want to use something in the background, like threads, I don't know if that's a, an R thing, but in other programming languages, you just have like a process in the background because then a while will block your like workflow. Like it will stay there, like running and running and running. There's um, a package called call R uh, that you can create background R processes mm -hmm. with. So I, it's limited to the number of like for, uh, logical processors that your processor has, mm -hmm. but um, you can create up to that many background processes doing whatever you want in those background processes, um, but monitoring them and like when they return into the main feed gets tricky, like with anything asynchronous, um, like when it returns has to be handled. There's um, like the promises package, future and call R all work with like asynchronous R stuff. 
How does that compare to like the new jobs tab in our studio where you can submit jobs to run in the background? Do you know? Um, I think the like they do basically the same thing, but jobs is more when you like have an intentional thing that's maybe a long running process that you're starting and running it in the background as a job and it'll complete and you'll get your data or whatever you need. Whereas call R is more of kind of like a mini process or a sub process of a script where you need the script based on a condition to initiate a background process and then monitor something for a period of time and then re return back to the same script. Um, and so like when two scripts are needing to have two processes occurring simultaneously at different points, like then you would use something like call our promises to like run that background process to do its thing and then come back into the main script. Whereas a job would just like go and complete, I guess, I guess it, you can make it return to the global environment. And so you could use that in the same way you just have to make sure that your, your, your script is like separate. Like you have to run it as a script that's already been written. Um, like that's just the parameters of job run script is to pass a script itself. Whereas call R, you can just pass like an expression in. I tend to use a lot uh, for each with uh, like the do parallel those. And I mean, for work, people always want like a progress bar thing. But then I tell them like those, I mean, those are not synchronous. Like I can't give you a progress bar or I haven't figured out an efficient way to show that. And I just give them a message and tell them, oh, you just wait. <laughs> Cause I mean, they will run in the background, but, uh, and I have a log file, which I could parse, but it's, it, I feel like it's too much work to try to do like a nice progress bar for them for something that won't take like more than a few minutes. So people always want that thing. Um, Future has that built in now. Um, so with like a, an argument, you can, you can now either just have like the zero to 100% but I think you can also now add in your own custom progress um, metrics because the, the, the default kind of estimates it. And so it might go to like 50% and sit there for a long time and then all of a sudden complete. Um, <laughs> but you can actually add in your own like progress markers. I think it was like the last or the second to last updated future, they allowed you to add in your own progress markers and like tell it what percent it should be at when it reaches a certain point in the process. There's also a progress R package, which I think, yeah, future developers were kind of saying that you should actually use that <laughs> um, if you want like really precise um, progress bars. And I think they support more than just um, the package progress R. I think they support more than just um, like future uh, functions, I think you can apply to like just about anything, even like parallel processes, obviously. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I think future relies on that. Um, I don't know Let's... if you want to go back to the exercises. <laughs> I was kind of wondering what the most useful function people has have discovered in like the past week or two weeks is. Mm. Let's see. Every once in a while I have like an aha and like discover something that I might have looked for multiple times and never found it. And that happened to me in the past week. Um, I don't know if y'all use like browser or the debugger, but like I use it all the time, literally all the time. And I always thought that like, if you use the debugger and it brings you into a certain level of the call stack, I've always thought you're just stuck there. And you can't actually, if it's like deep in a function, you can't see the level of the call stack where 
the variable of interest that caused it to error entered into the function. And so I'm like, well, ah, that's kind of useless. And so I always thought you had to go and like put browser in your script and put the condition to get it to fire at that point in time. And then you'd have to like hit enter down to the point that it errors. And sometimes you'll miss it and then you'll have to restart the process again. So <laughs> I've been doing that for like two and a half years. And then just like the other day, I finally put in the right words to Google and found a Stack Overflow post about the utils recover function. Basically, if you're anywhere in browser debugging, you just type in utils recover and you can select which layer of the call stack you wanna bounce up to. And you can check out the variables and anything in there. And I was like, oh my gosh, this would have saved like hundreds and hundreds of hours if I had known this two years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess that's the amazing thing of the internet. Yeah, well, you have to ask the right question, like, and use the right words, because then you can try different ways, and it will get you like some random stuff that is not related. But I mean, it's relatable. I hate sometimes when I find like very, very old answers on the Stack Overflow, and that uh, they have updated the libraries or the package, they stop like maintaining it, and so now it doesn't work or it's not compatible with something else. Oh, well, yeah, I feel that when you find it, it's like, wow, yeah. Like, <laughs> On the topic of debugging, actually, I was going to say the trace function um, has an optional argument called edit. Um, and I like saw a use case of this on Twitter. Like, I think it's like literally today <laughs> or like yesterday. Um, but I uh, put in the link for it. But basically, if you um, want to change a uh, like in function that's internal to a package, um, and you don't want to like fork the entire package and like edit it on GitHub and install that version to your um, machine and then run it with those changes, um, you can just do trace and put in the function in question as the first argument. If you and if you set edit to true. Um, you can change the content of package internal functions for the session. Um, and so a use case um, that I linked to is that in ggplot2, if you call panel on top, then it draws the plot and then the x-axis major lines and the y-axis major lines. But if you want to flip that, then you have to go into whatever function draws the grid lines in ggplot2 and then change the order. Um, and a really easy way to do that is just to call trace, um, put the grid drawing function that edit to true, and then it'll open up like a GUI where you can just like, you know, it shows you the function um, and you can just modify it. That is super useful. <laughs> that is super useful. Thank you for that. I've literally run into like two things in the past 48 hours where I need that function and I did not know it existed. There's like a thing that's malfunctioning in a package I'm using and that will fix it. Super awesome. Thank you. Nice. Okay, um, anything else? Is there, I haven't looked through all the chapters. Is there a chapter on debugging in this book? I think so. Chapter 22, um, <laughs> are down. Cool, looking yeah. forward to that. I feel it like at a more. certain point, like, 60% of the time is spent just debugging something. So many edge cases. Yeah. Did anyone look in the companion at this complexity section for this chapter about cyclomatic complexity? I didn't really know. I've never heard of that before. 
What is the companion? Um, the R for data science group has a companion for the book with, I think it was cohort one, just put together a document of all their questions. Ah, do you have a link for that? Yeah. Here's what I'm looking at. I don't. Okay, cool. Thank you. And I think I look at that if you have. Does anyone know what? I'm not a computer scientist, so I don't know what cyclomatic complexity means. My background is in computer science, but I'm not sure to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the depth of the call stack. <laughs> I'm like just guessing. I don't I don't even know what a call stack is. <laughs> it's like the um, like when you start at a top level of a function and then it like runs into another function, it drops down into that function, and then there's like a sub expression and it drops down into that. So that would like be three layers deep in the call stack. Mm. So yeah, this says like the for loop is the most complicated, or I guess has the most layers. Yeah, according to this, it has 23, whatever those units are. If yeah, I th think it was probably early on that they defined those functions, maybe. Uh, can you see that it's my web browser? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, oh. on top of some R. Okay. Yeah, that was the, the slides. Um, let's see where they defined those. Um... It doesn't really say. No. Yeah, I remember when I studied uh, recursion, the typical recursive call for a function, the something else we used to get in a lot is that you exceed the number of levels that you can call the function. Like, um, I don't remember the exact number, but it was like there was a limit of how many times you could call, a function could call itself. Um, and I don't know what is the like, Limit in R, do you know? Um, is there a limit? I, don't know. I think I've heard about that too. There is a limit on that. Mm. Well, they use this package, cyclocomp. Sorry, I can't store it. Okay. Hmm. F okay, so this if fun like if function, if else function, those are expressions that uh, this library, cyclocomp, understands. So mm -hmm. if you do, I don't know if you can see my R screen. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of small. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let's see. Maybe that's too big. That looks good. So yeah, if you call it like this, cyclo clump, and then cyclo clump, and then there's an expression, you can say if function or if else mm. function. And let's see what the for. 
Mm. Maybe not. See how they call it. I think it's from their cohort one presentation. No, I just have to go back and look. I had um, those. Uh, let me see. Because I have them here. Presentations. Like that. Cohort one. Okay. Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe with when they did live coding, probably. Yeah. Probably on the YouTube. I guess that's the homework for everyone. <laughs> and watch cohort. I think this one. book, this companion is also on the GitHub. Maybe. Yeah. That's where I got to. Let's see. Oh, yeah, here we go. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's in the R markdown for the, that companion. But they have this like beer data set that I think they used. Oh, yeah. This one here. Oh. Wait, I think maybe this yeah. is review. Yeah, I was gonna put some examples, but I was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> so I was just went with the simple examples from the textbook. Which I think do we have someone for next week? Yeah. yeah. So me June I think. will be presenting chapter six. Yeah, it's in, actually really big so i'll um <laughs> let you know if yeah, i feel like i might need it split up um, yeah i think we could split in two weeks i don't know how does that how does uh, that work i i would like give it a shot and if i like need help and need someone to take over like the second half for hmm? uh another week or the week after yeah. whatever yeah I'll, I'll let people know Sounds good. Yeah, if anyone wants to sign up for future chapters, feel free. I definitely will sign up here for object-oriented programming. I really want to learn more about those. I have barely used S3 and kind of get it, uh, but I think I'm still missing a few things. So, I guess yeah, right can... now. Hmm? Go ahead. I was going to say, if, June, if you just tag us in the advanced R book club channel, if yeah. uh, you want somebody to pick up some mm -hmm. part of the chapter, then just tag tag us in there and we'll, somebody okay. will pick it up. Yeah, I'll do that. All right. Um, I guess. We are almost over. I don't know. Yeah. It was fun. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. It's always okay. really useful to talk to, to people who has done so much stuff that <laughs> I might need in the future or I might be doing wrong. Thank you for presenting. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. That was, we got some really good bits of information out of that. Mm. Thank you. Hey, Stay safe. Bye. 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 See you next week. Yeah. Yeah.